there, I'm Anita, a science pro and robotics prodigy. I've won countless trophies, including one for making a talking replica of BB-8. But it's my crush's heart that I can't win. Tom has just refused to accompany me to the last middle school dance. But who cares? I've got my bestie Barb. It'll still be fun. We can go together. We arrived at the dance to find that everyone had dates, except for us. Well, this is a little awkward. Move. This is a dance floor, grannies. Either you dance or get out. I bet this is the first party you've ever got to attend. As if Tom would go out with such a loser. Yeah, you should try asking your robots out instead. As they walked off laughing, I felt so disheartened. Barb told me not to listen to them, but their words niggled away at me. I realized if I didn't change, then I'd waste the rest of my teen years by being a loser that got left out of all the fun. I needed to reinvent myself now before it was too late. Over the summer break, I thought it over and realized that there was only one way forward. I should flip the script, where nobody knew who I was. And this is the perfect occasion for that. High school! I purposely chose a school that's across the city. It's a bit inconvenient, but that's how to be sure I'd not run into anyone from my local middle school. Of course, except for Barb. She's going there with me also. Hey, recognize me? I'm still Anita. Like my new look? I've had a style update, ditched my glasses and all the uncool geeky stuff. Ooh, let's surprise my bestie. <laughs> Anita? Whoa, talk about a Captain Marvel transformation. Gee, thanks. This hair color is so in season right now. Hang on, you look just like Chelsea. Oh, do I? How funny. You sound like her too. Okay, so Chelsea was this popular girl from middle school. Um, yeah, I may have spent all summer studying her. Alright, I actually mirrored her style and mannerisms. I'm just learning to better myself. This isn't any different from using humans as models when programming a robot. Besides, it's not like Chelsea's here to mind. Speaking of robots, how's your BB-8? No, that's my past. We'll never be cool and get boyfriends if our peers think we're nerds. Come with me after school, I'll give you a makeover too. It's okay, Anita. I don't mind being a nerd. But if this makes you happy, then you have my full support. My sweet, naive Barb has no idea how incredible being cool would be. They are the cool kids here, aka celebrities. They're so dazzling and popular. And oh my god, who's that? He's so dreamy. So I confidently strutted over to introduce myself to the whole group when... Ah! Luckily, no one seemed to notice my fall, or they just didn't care. <sighs> Anyways, this was only my first day here. I had loads of time to fit in with the celebrities. And then catch that hottie, who supposedly named Eric's attention. At first, the popular girls didn't notice me, but then a few days in, Lou, the celebrity's leader, had a lipstick emergency and I sprung to her rescue. See? I told you, this burgundy shade really pops against your cool undertone. Ruby Woo? That's so 2015, Ashley. You can put that away. And easy peasy, I became part of the group. They invited me to their parties, shopping trips, and spa days. It's like entering a completely new world. An extra shiny one. I got to sit with them at lunch where they ubered low-calorie food. Normally, I had the same as them, but today my mom packed me a special sandwich with the moist maker, just like Ross's from Friends. Sorry, guys, but Anita doesn't share food! <laughs> Are you seriously going to drink that? You can practically see the fat and lactose swirling in it. Gross! Oh, okay. Looks like the moist maker would have to wait. I looked around and saw Barb sharing her mom's amazeballs mac and cheese with her new geeky friends. I've not spoken to Barb properly in weeks. We kept trying to reschedule as I had manicures with Lou, Haley's party, and all these ever after school shopping trips. Which kept getting so expensive. Aren't you gonna buy that? You haven't bought anything. Um, that's because I only wear tailor-made clothes made of Egyptian cotton or at least silk linen. Um, okay. In that case, you can be our assistant. Make sure you wear a cute cardigan tomorrow for a OOTD Instagram post. Ashley has made a list of the available colors. That's why I had to use all of my allowance on this cardigan. But it's fine. That's just how popular clicks have to be. And it's so nice of them to let me hang around. I proudly strutted alongside the celebs, looking just like one of them. Other students gawped at us, and it sure felt good. But suddenly, this dizzy spell came over me. I started shaking and feeling cold, then pitch black. I woke up in the infirmary to Barb's worried face. Oh good, you're awake. It's no surprise you passed out. You aren't eating enough. What? I'm eating just fine. Besides, skinny is chic. I'm not arguing with you. You're lucky your head didn't hit the floor thanks to Eric. Eric saved me? He must have caught me like in a romantic movie. This diet is amazing. 
I wouldn't have been in Eric's arms without it. Later, I tried to thank him, but he put his headphones on and walked off, and I never saw him at any of the celebs' parties or anything. A hot guy like him is probably hanging out with an even cooler clique and interested in even more popular girls. I need to try harder. But my geeky side wasn't going to stay suppressed. One time, this guy slated Spider-Man 2099, my favorite character ever. Dude doesn't understand how the multiverse works, and his suit sucks. Are you kidding me? As if you know how it works, his suit incorporates Parker tech and has stealth features and exploding spider saucers. Okay, cool it, new girl. It's just some weirdo jumps around in spandex. Right, be cool. Cool kids didn't geek out over superheroes. Luckily, everyone else seemed distracted. I turned to look and saw them already flocked around some new kid with a huge backpack, a comic t-shirt, and jeans. Huh, it's like looking at middle school me. When I managed to get a closer look, I almost fell over in shock. It was Chelsea! Why would pretty popular Chelsea do a total 180 on her looks? I tried to avoid Chelsea, but then one time when I was trying to approach Eric, she appeared and he actually spoke to her. Does Chelsea know Eric? Since when? How come? Ah! Time stopped as I stared into his big dreamy eyes, but falling for each other again? <laughs> he might as well just stay in his arms. I quickly walked away and passed Chelsea. Our eyes met. Did she recognize me? She didn't say anything, but was that a smirk I saw? I needed to find out if Chelsea really recognized me, so I turned to Barb. It was a bit awkward, as we hadn't spoken in a while. But luckily, Barb was cool about it and said she'd try to find out. We chatted a bit, and then she asked me, We are still going to Comic-Con on the 7th, right? Yeah, of course! Can't wait! I was excited about Comic-Con, until... A few days later, the celebrities had a big announcement. They were attending Conan Gray's concert on the 7th. Are you coming, or do you have some tragic nerdy convention to go to? Huh? That's oddly specific. I panicked and said yes to the concert. We had to give money to Asher the next day, and she would take care of purchasing everyone's tickets. But thanks to that overpriced cardigan, how am I supposed to afford this? Hmm, I guess there was one way to pay for it. Me and Barb's Comic-Con fund, which we'd been saving since middle school. I was only borrowing and would definitely pay it back. The following day, the celebs gathered to discuss the concert. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flustered-looking Barb. What about her plan? Did you just spend all your savings on some concert you don't even care about? I'm sorry, I promise I'll pay you back. I just needed some time. So, you spent my share too? How could you? I felt terrible. I never meant to upset my friend like that. I just really wanted to fit in. Only, after that day, I found myself miserable with the celebs. The more time I spent with them, the more things about them got me second-guessing this group's dynamic. For instance, they talked a lot about the importance of being eco-friendly, but ordered Uber Eats almost every day, and constantly brought new, cute, reusable straws in Stanley Cups. Moreover, it was always lose weight or the highway, and they even trash-talked their own group members behind their backs. I found myself often looking around for Barb and then feeling extra guilty. On my way home, I was dragging my feet, feeling awful, when I passed an appliance store. I saw some students from my school's robotics team struggling with their droid, so I gladly offered a hand. If you want my lunch money, take it, but please leave Gears Brosnan alone! We worked hard on it! I tried explaining that I just wanted to help, but they kept pushing me away. I stared down at myself and realized that I wasn't welcomed because I'd given up everything to look like a celebrity. However, I didn't feel like one. I'd stood by and let the celebs push everyone else around. Was this really the life I wanted? That weekend was supposed to be spa day with the celebs, so I went out to the mall to ask Lou for my concert ticket. I was going to sell it and pay Barb back. Only when I got there, I saw Chelsea with them. But she looked like her cool self again. Uh-oh, I better go. But too late. Chelsea caught me and told everyone. Guys, look who's here. Fun fact, Anita and I used to be friends back in middle school. Cover yourself in foundation all you want, but your nerdiness will still show. Everyone started laughing, and that's when it dawned on me. They were all in on Chelsea's plans to expose me. I wanted to leave, but I still needed my ticket back. Sure, you can have it back, but on one condition. Wash off your Chelsea disguise and go back to being pathetic little you again. And so they told me to wash my hair in this decorative basin in a lush store, before everyone's confused eyes and their live streaming cameras. I swallowed my pride and did it, for Barb. But afterward, Lou turned back on her word. Actually, I gave it to Chelsea. Tough luck. Oops, too bad I never agreed to the deal Lou made with you. I felt overcome with panic and shame. I ran and I bumped into someone. Eric! Seeing how upset I was, he took me for coffee and a chat. 
As soon as we sat down, I burst into tears and told him how I'd lost everything. My popularity, dignity, friends. It all started to fall apart when Chelsea turned up all of a sudden, and then the domino effect took over. Chelsea? I'd always known she's catty, but I never thought she'd go that far. How can you be friends with her? <laughs> what? No, it's not what you think. You still don't recognize me? What do you mean, recognize? Then he revealed that he was from my middle school. I was shooketh! But if I squinted real hard, I guess he did look vaguely familiar. Whoa, puberty hit you like a truck. Same for you. Yeah, no, it wasn't puberty for me. I got emotionally scarred from being an outcast and became afraid of missing out on cool stuff, so I turned myself into a Chelsea clone to be popular. That's insane. But if it means anything, I prefer the old you. It's great seeing you at the school. But when I saw that you changed and joined the celebs, I was kind of apprehensive. But for real, though, I would have died for you to notice me. I was beyond surprised. He liked me all along? Suddenly, Chelsea jumped in. Why has it always been her? I changed myself to look like her. Didn't you say you liked nerdy girls? So why not me? Say what? Chelsea liked Eric? So she really copied my look. And for that reason? I'm sorry, Chelsea, but it's my feelings. I can't believe you rejected me twice for this little nerd, and she doesn't even look like herself anymore. Chelsea, it's never been about looks. It's about who she is. In the midst of it, I finally understood something. I was fine just being me. I never needed to be anything else. I've switched schools and turned myself into a dork for you. Ah! You're lucky this time. I watched Chelsea stomp out. I realized how I was constantly anxious and on edge that I'd messed up while hanging out with the celebrities. I missed the truly happy moments with real friends where I could just be me. All this time, I thought I'd been missing out on all the fun, but turns out, I missed nothing. The true way to have beautiful teenage years is to spend it with people that really appreciate you and do the things that you actually enjoy. I thanked Eric, then left. There was something important I needed to do first. I went home and fixed my BB-8, then took it over to Barb's house. Sorry, Barb. I'm so sorry, Barb. I was so desperate to be cool that I overlooked what really mattered. I miss you and our friendship so much. I missed you too, and I saw that humiliating video and just wanted to know you were okay. On second thoughts, I'll forgive you if you give me your BB-8. <laughs> no can do, as I'm selling it online to make money to pay you back. I only brought it here to make my apology more meaningful. Did it work? We both hug. The next few days at school, I tried my best to fix things. I returned to my old image, well, with a slight upgrade. I can't let my beauty skills go to waste now. And I dug out all my geeky stuff. I showed up at the robotics club, and this time, I confidently strode over and immediately fixed their robot. I told you I could help. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's a celebrity's job. Look at you, all happy and smiley with your own loser nerd kind. Yeah, I'm happy, while you once tried and failed to be one of us, remember? Being a nerd isn't just about appearance, it's about what's inside. By the way, how was the concert? I heard your fanatic behavior got you kicked out. Sounds exciting. Chelsea and the celebs looked fuming as they sashayed off, but I didn't care, as I was finally back where I belonged. Hey guys, Ellie here, again. I'm going to share with you the final part of my story, and trust me, you won't want to miss it. In part two of my story, my revenge plan really got underway. Brian went to New York to work for three months, and I managed to seduce Clark. Now we're dating, and I almost have all the info I need to make Sasha's company crash. But after an amazing day out with Clark, I came home, and you will not believe what was waiting for me. Brian was there. He was sitting in my living room, and he looked so angry. He'd flown home that afternoon and couldn't wait to spend that weekend with me. But when he arrived at my house to surprise me, I wasn't there. He was about to call me to ask where I was when he received a photo from his friend. It was of me and Clark. Turns out his friend had seen us sharing a picnic by the Golden Gate Bridge and had sneakily taken a photo of us kissing each other and sent it to Brian. And he was mad. He started shouting at me, saying, How could you cheat on me like this? He looked heartbroken and all I could do was cry. I couldn't even explain myself because the truth was much worse. If he knew it was just to hurt his mom, he'd never forgive me. In the end, he stormed out, leaving me there crying. But I had to be strong. I had to focus on my revenge. I didn't have time to sit and cry over Brian. For now, I'd have to put him to the side and try not to think about him. When Monday rolled around, I was exhausted. I'd barely slept the whole weekend and couldn't bear going to work. But I had no choice. 
The day dragged by, and by the time 5 p.m. rolled around, I waited until everyone left, and then I went to Clark's office. I gave him a hug, and he started massaging my neck, and said, Baby, you look so tired. What's up? I replied, saying, No, I'm good. In fact, I'm much better now that I've seen you. Although, I would say no to a cup of coffee. Of course, Clark happily went and made me one, and as soon as he was out of the room, I ran to his desk and started rummaging around looking for the documents. But I couldn't find them anywhere. Had he put them in a drawer? I quickly checked, but while I was doing that, Clark walked back into the room. Ellie, what are you doing? I got the fright of my life and stood up saying, um, nothing, just helping you tidy up your desk. It's such a mess. At that moment, my phone suddenly beeped. I went to grab it, but Clark got to it first. Oh no. Suddenly his face changed as he read my text. Then he said, what's going on, Ellie? You better explain yourself quick. He handed me my phone back and I couldn't believe it. It was my old colleague, Amy, asking if I'd got the last document yet to show how the app was put together. I felt so sick and I knew I couldn't lie anymore. I looked back up at Clark and in tears, I told him everything. Clark, I know you're probably going to hate me after I tell you this and I don't blame you, but please just hear me out. Sasha is a nasty woman. She was actually my dad's mistress when I was a kid, and she tore apart my family. I'm so sorry, Clark, but I'm actually engaged to Brian, Sasha's son. I only took this job because I wanted to find a chance to ruin her business and life. As soon as I saw Sasha was interested in you, I decided to try and get you to like me, so that I can let her know what it's like when she loses someone she loves. Then, by using you, I'd take all the confidential info to... to... Ugh! I'm so sorry, Clark. By the time I'd finished telling him, I was crying so much I could barely breathe, and I knew Clark would be deeply upset. But instead, something crazy happened. He came over and hugged me. He told me to calm down, and then he said, Revenge is pointless, Ellie. It doesn't do anyone any good, especially not you. I know Sasha hurt you, but you need to let that go. It's in the past now. Sure, it might make you feel good right now, but in the long run, will you be any happier? I just cried even more then. Why was he still being so nice to me? I didn't deserve this. I kept apologizing, and he said he understood why I'd done it all, and that he forgave me. He said, I know you have a good heart in there. You just got a little lost. That's all. But promise me one thing. Please don't hand over the documents to your old company. Our company has worked so hard on this. Please don't do it, Ellie. Well, it was the least I could do after everything I'd done to him so far. I promised not to hand the documents over, and after I left Clark in the office, I realized something. I actually liked him. Not just as a friend or colleague, but as something more. I had actual feelings for him, and now I'd gone and hurt him so much, I felt awful. And there were still a couple of other things I had to deal with, too. As soon as I got home, I called Brian, but he didn't answer. I knew I couldn't wait any longer, so I left him a voice message explaining everything. I ended the message by saying sorry, but I knew Brian would struggle to forgive me, and I didn't blame him. Not only had I cheated on him, I'd even tried to harm his mom. Anyway, she was his mom, even if she'd done bad stuff in her past. The next morning, I quit my job. People were shocked, but I just told them I wanted to go home and be with my mom. When I was packing my stuff at my office, I found a note paper from Clark saying, Leave the grief behind and live happily, my darling. A good girl like you deserves happiness. So Clark wasn't angry with me at all. That's enough. Now I could leave without any worries. Over the next few days, I packed up all my stuff and left San Fran. My heart was aching the whole time, but I knew I needed to get out of there and clear my head. I just checked in at the airport when Brian called me. I was so nervous to answer his call, as I hadn't heard back from him since I left the voice message. I held my breath as I accepted the call and prepared for him to shout at me. But it didn't happen. Still, with his usual sweetness and calm, he told me he was so shocked by my message he hadn't known what to say to me. It had taken him a few days to think everything through, and now he said he was ready to talk. I'm not mad at you, Ellie he said, but you should have shared your childhood stuff with me earlier. And why didn't you tell me that it was my mom your dad ran off with? 
We could have worked through this. I'm so sorry my mom was the one that tore your family apart. But she's different now. Please just give her a chance. Brian, I'm sorry for everything. I'm glad that you're not angry with me. But to forgive your mom? I think I need more time. It seemed that Brian was about to say something, but that's when I heard the airport announcement asking passengers in my flight to proceed to the boarding gate. Therefore, I had no choice but to hang up the phone. Um, Brian, listen. I'm so sorry, but my plane is ready for boarding. Can I call you back soon, huh? Where are you going, he asked. I told him I was going to stay with my mom for a bit. Well, I reckon that it'll be better for you now. Take your time and think things through, especially our relationship. I was startled as he said, our relationship, but realized he was right. I definitely needed some time to work things out. Could I ever forgive Sasha? I loved Brian, but was that love big enough to leave all this behind? I mean, I didn't know whether I could see Sasha as my mother-in-law or not. And how would my mom react to this? I got on the plane and sat down. For the first time in months, my heart felt more peaceful again, and I felt like I could really sleep. It's right. Neither Brian nor Clark hated me. Things would be okay. I was just about to close my eyes when I heard someone say my name. I looked up, and to my complete shock, Clark was walking down the aisle of the plane. He sat in the seat right opposite me and turned to me with the biggest grin and said, I've never been to L.A. before. Want to be my tour guide? Oh my god, I couldn't believe this. What was he doing here? I was so shocked to see him, but at the same time, there was no denying the excitement I felt. No one could ever say I led a boring life, that's for sure. I gave Clark a smile and said, sure, to him. I have no idea what the future holds for me, but I guess I'll find out soon. Wish me luck. Hi, my name's Crystal, and my family are super wealthy. I have never needed to work, but I wanted to. So me and my friend Alice decided to become entrepreneurs, and my dad helped fund our startup. We both love shopping, so we created a really cool app that helps you choose the latest trends to suit your body. And unlike my friends, I was single, but I didn't mind. In fact, I loved how free I felt. However, there was just one small problem. My parents weren't okay with this. They were desperate for me to find someone and get married, and that's when they decided to take matters into their own hands. They started setting me up on blind dates. I told them I could easily find my own date, but they said that whoever I dated had to come from a good, wealthy family. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't even interested in dating especially as I'd had some really bad relationships in college. That's also why my parents wanted to find someone for me, as they'd hated the guys I'd dated before and didn't trust me that I wouldn't make the same mistakes again. I refused to go, but then my dad said something that sent chills up my spine. Okay, don't go, but then your startup is over. I'll take away all your funding. Wait, no, that couldn't happen. We'd worked so hard to build the app, and the only way we could afford it was with my dad's help. Fine, I'll go, but I can't promise I'll like these guys, I said. I went on the date, and then many more after that, and I quickly became an expert at making sure those boys wouldn't be interested in me. And yet still, I was keeping my parents happy by going on the dates. It was a win-win. But before I became a pro at this blind date game, there were many awkward and hilarious situations that I had to go through. On one of my first dates, we met up in the lounge of a hotel. All I knew was that the guy Trent owned the hotel and that his family were a big name in some hotel chains in the area. I was running late and the parking lot in the basement was jam-packed. I finally managed to find an empty spot and I was rushing to get to it. But then out of nowhere, another car also appeared and was heading for the same spot. We ended up bumping into each other. Both our cars got badly scratched and mine even had a dent. Oh no, my baby. I was so upset. This was my Porsche that my parents had bought me for my sweet 16th. 
And even though I have a ton of other cars at home, this was my most favorite. Who would dare to hurt my child like this? I stomped out of the car and started yelling at the guy. He climbed out of his car and he was wearing a hat, so I couldn't really see his face. But I guessed he was younger than me. Could he be the valet parking boy or something? But then he started speaking and said that it was my fault because I'd been going in the wrong direction and that he had every right to make me pay for the damage done to his car. What? He's the one who should have been paying for the damage on my car. Well, that just made me even more furious. And then he had the cheek to say he was in a rush and he handed me his business card and said we'd settle this later. I snatched that card out of his hand and threw it in my bag without even looking. That would be my lawyer's problem, not mine. And to make matters worse, he had taken the parking spot. So now I still had to find somewhere else to park. It took me ages. And by then, I figured my date wouldn't have even waited for me. I arrived at the table that had been reserved for us, and of course he was already sitting there. From afar, I was impressed. He looked like a total babe. Maybe my parents' taste wasn't so bad after all. And his outfit was on point. In fact, I'd seen it somewhere before. Must have been a new trend. I said hi to him and sat down, but he just started laughing. And after like one minute of smiling at me, he said hi back. Then he started to introduce himself, and I realized who he was. He was the guy I just bumped into in the parking lot. Oh my god, this couldn't be happening. This was too awkward. I pretended to look for something in my bag, and then quickly glanced at his name card. Yep, it said general manager on it. Oh man, I was doomed. I tried my best to act like nothing had happened. I mean, maybe he didn't recognize me. Ugh, who am I kidding? Of course he did. And as the date went on, he kept teasing me about it, saying that the parking spot was reserved for hotel staff. I was kind of bummed. I mean, he was so cute. And I'd completely ruined my chances. I felt bad for creating such a bad impression and begged him not to tell my parents. He agreed that it would be our little secret. And after that, things were better. We actually got really close and even became good friends. You're probably wondering why we didn't hit it off. Well, turns out he's actually gay. He trusted me enough to come out to me. That's how close we were. He hadn't even told his parents yet. And that's why these blind dates are as much of a nuisance for him as they are for me. So, he's the one who helped me come up with the idea to act like a bad girl, to turn off the other guys on dates all based on his actual experience of our date. <laughs> Ever since then, whenever I went on a blind date, I was intentionally late so that I'd make the worst impression possible. I'd wear my bad girl outfit, which was an oversized black shirt, ripped jeans, and dirty sneakers. And of course, I'd always chew gum. Make sure to have this annoyed look on my face all the time. This drove rich guys crazy, and none of them ever asked for a second date with me. But one time, it didn't go to plan. The guy I was on a date with, Corey, he saw right through me, and even had the guts to confront me about what I was trying to do. It made me so mad, and it was the worst date ever. But still, he told his parents that it went well, and he wanted to see me again. He surely wanted to pick a fight with me. Since he was the only guy that I'd been on a blind date with that had given positive feedback, my parents were super stoked upon hearing this, and they made me continue seeing him. Otherwise, they said they'd take away my cars and cancel my credit cards. I couldn't stand him. He was your typical bad boy player type who thought he owned the world. He didn't even work. His dad just made up a position for him in the family business. What a spoiled brat! And we didn't even actually date. He just rang me up anytime he wanted and made me go to places with him, as if I was just an accessory to him. It's such a waste of time, but what else could I do? One day, we were at the country club to celebrate his dad's 60th. It was so boring, so I snuck outside for a bit. He caught me playing on my phone, and he literally snatched it out of my hand and teased me with it. He thought it was hilarious until he realized that I'd been texting with Trent. Suddenly, he looked really distant. Then he asked if I was close to this guy. I didn't even have a chance to respond. He quickly returned my phone and just left me standing there. I didn't get it. Was he jealous or something? 
After that, he disappeared for a few weeks, which was really odd because normally he was all up in my face all the time. My parents were worried, and they forced me to go check to see if he was okay. Why is he so bothersome? I didn't want to go at all, but still, I had to. I got to his apartment, and the whole place smelled like alcohol. I mumbled in annoyance. Hey, are you an alcoholic or something? I thought you'd maybe been sick, but okay then. I see. Then he said, this is all because of you. I was confused. What had I done? I was about to leave when I noticed something. It was a crumpled photo of Trent and Corey. Oh my god. Am I seeing things or what? I picked it up. Corey glanced over inside. After a really awkward silence, Corey told me that Trent was his ex. What? So Corey was gay too? They broke up because they had planned to run away together because neither of them were brave enough to come out to their parents. But then Corey had bailed on the plan when his dad had offered him a position in the company and a huge inheritance. He couldn't give that up. Trent had been so hurt because Corey had chosen money over their relationship. It's been two years since then and Corey regrets it a lot, but Trent won't even give him the time of day anymore. That's when Corey asked me to help him speak to Trent again. Oh god, I don't know if I should do it because I don't want Trent to date such a bad guy again. Plus, maybe Trent will just think I'm taking Corey's side and cut me out of his life too. But what if Corey really has changed? Can you imagine what it's like to be so pretty that people actually bully you because of it? Most of you are probably thinking that being pretty is an amazing thing, but just wait until you hear my story. I'm Jasmine, and I'm 16 years old. And yep, I am indeed named after Princess Jasmine, because the moment I was born, my dad said I looked exactly like her. So growing up, I was naturally very pretty, and the older I got, the more the boys chased me. But I was oblivious to this. Just because I was pretty didn't mean I was arrogant about it. In fact, I was a very caring kid. I always liked to help people in my class and really didn't care about the way people looked. I wanted to help everyone. One time in third grade, there were three boys fighting and I went to help them. But to my complete shock, they were fighting over me. Our teacher eventually broke up the fight and had to split them all up and make them sit on the opposite side of the classroom, away from me. I was so shocked. Why would people fight over me? Well, by the time I was in fifth grade, I'd gotten even prettier, and at one point, there were five guys fighting over me. One day, two of those guys, Jack and Tyler, were both running towards me from opposite sides of the playground. I was just standing there watching them come towards me, and I panicked and quickly jumped out of the way. They both ended up bashing into each other and fell over. Honestly, it was so funny. I helped them up, but inside, I was dying of laughter. Most girls would probably love getting attention like that, but it drove me crazy. I just wanted people to like me for who I was, not because I was pretty. Even though I got tons of attention from boys, the girls didn't like me. There was one girl called Mia who hated me so much, she actually bullied me. She would always go out of her way to do horrible things to me. Like this one time where she jumped on me in gym class and broke my right arm. She pretended it was an accident, but I know she deliberately did it. And obviously, I use my right arm for everything. So it was torture. I cried so much because for months, I couldn't write anything. And writing was my most favorite thing in the world. And that wasn't the only horrible encounter with Mia. One time I was at the park with my big brother, and he left me alone on the swings so he could go hang out with his friends. As soon as he was out of sight, I saw Mia heading towards me. She looked angry, and I quickly closed my eyes because I was so scared. I thought she was going to hit me. But suddenly, I heard someone running, and I opened my eyes just in time to see my brother grab her arm to stop her from hitting me. He was protecting me, but then he took it too far. He hit her in the face so hard, he knocked her front tooth out. She was screaming and crying, and my brother just grabbed me and made me run out of the park with him. After that, Mia didn't bother me anymore. I moved up to middle school and never saw her again, but my life didn't get much better. You see, 
At my new school, the uniforms were so ugly. I went from being the pretty girl to a complete tomboy. We had to wear these red polo shirts with baggy nude pants. Honestly, it was not a good look for me. Sure, I was glad not to be the girl guys were fighting over anymore, but I didn't like feeling ugly in the uniform. Then, when we had the school dance, we were finally allowed to wear whatever we wanted. I decided to wear my favorite little black dress that showed off my curvy body. As soon as I walked through the doors into the dance, all eyes were on me. I couldn't believe how much of a difference my outfit could make. All the guys kept trying to get my attention, but I just wanted to dance. It was such a fun night, but the next day was crazy. I got to class and we had to hand in our essays. I went to give mine to the teacher, and when I was walking back to my seat, a girl called Paloa stopped me and said, Jasmine, everyone knows your melons are fake. You had plastic surgery, didn't you? She said it so loud and everyone started laughing, even my friends. I was so embarrassed and just ran out of there crying. Why would she say something like that? To make matters even worse, when I eventually came back to my desk, I noticed someone had messed with my artwork. I love drawing, especially Dragon Ball characters, and I'd drawn a Goku that morning. Someone had ruined it by drawing fake boobs, and then underneath they'd written, You are so fake. I honestly wanted to run out of there and never go back. People were being so mean. Suddenly, a guy called Peter, who was always quite horrible to me, grabbed the drawing and ripped it up. I didn't understand how people could treat me like this. The rest of my middle school life was pretty much the same. I felt miserable, and I thought, finally, high school would be better. But on my first day, I was sitting alone, and I heard a group of girls whispering about me. They were all really pretty and popular, and I tried to ignore them, but two of them came over to me and sat on either side of me. I felt terrified, but suddenly, one of them said, Oh my god, you're so pretty. How come you're eating all alone? You can come sit at our table because you're pretty enough. After my middle school experience, I was so happy that people were being nice to me again. Soon I started hanging out with the pretty girls all the time, and the leader of the group, Ashley, she asked me if I had a boyfriend. And when I told her I didn't, she laughed and said, Don't you worry, we'll find you one. But I didn't want them to find me one, because the more I hung out with them, the more I realized that the guys they liked were total troublemakers, and I wasn't interested in those type of guys at all. After a few weeks of hanging out with them, I realized they were too much. I didn't want to spend my days gossiping and being surrounded by drama. Just because I was a pretty girl didn't mean I had to hang out with the pretty girls. I heard there was a new kid at school, and the girls were all making fun of him for some reason. I didn't like what they were saying about him. And so the next day, I decided to go introduce myself and see if he was okay. Well, I have no idea why people were making fun of him. He was gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous. But he was so shy, and so I just sat on a table near him and stared at him nonstop. I eventually plucked up the courage to go and introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jasmine, I said. Nice to meet you. Then he said, I'm Chris. Hi. And after that, we got chatting and I couldn't believe how much we had in common. I could see everyone staring at us chatting, but I didn't care. Chris said he'd worried that no one would want to be his friend, and I told him that I would be. After that, we started hanging out every day, and I quickly fell for him. He was kind of nerdy, but I liked that about him. One day, before Valentine's, he asked me what my favorite candy was. Then on Valentine's Day, he surprised me with flowers, a box of chocolates, and a teddy bear. Then a few days after, he gave me another surprise. He'd ordered all my favorite candy, Skittles, Sour Patch Kids, and Airheads. I was so happy. It was the most romantic thing anyone had ever done for me. And he wasn't interested in me just because I was pretty. He actually cared about me. We started dating soon after that, and then I had my first kiss. It was kind of funny because I never kissed anyone before, so I had no idea what I was doing, but it felt nice. And after a while, I really got the hang of it. And now we're so in love. It's been seven months since we started dating, and I never could have imagined my life could be so good now. We're even planning to get married in the future. I know we're still young, but when you know, you know.
Sally here. I'm 25 years old and I love makeup. I mean, I really love it. I don't even answer the door barefaced to the postman. My fascination with makeup started back when I was just a little kid. My mom was a famous beauty blogger and even created her own cosmetics brand. Everyone from renowned models to Hollywood actresses wanted to use her products. Back then, the industry was different. It wasn't about YouTube and different media channels. Instead, people like my mom had to take different avenues to promote their products. I remember how amazing it felt to walk into a drugstore and see my mom's makeup on the shelves. But then, my mom's world came crashing down, and it was all thanks to one lame model. I knew something was up when my dad picked me up from school. He barely ever picked me up. Mom always did. And weirder still, he didn't say a single word to me. Then, I walked into our house to find mom standing in front of the mirror as she smeared makeup all over her face. My mom was a glamorous, perfect-looking woman. I'd never seen her look or act like this before. I remember just staring at her, not knowing what I should do or say. Then she started crying, which caused the makeup to streak down her face. I remember thinking that she looked like a scary clown. She seemed so out of control. In a harsh tone, my dad said to her, Will you just look at yourself? How can you let Sally see you like this? Then he covered my eyes and pulled me out of there. I asked him what was going on, and he sighed and told me how a model had a bad reaction to the products during my mother's live webcast, and now she was getting treatment at the dermatology hospital. She blamed it on my mom's cosmetics products, which meant that both the press teams and police were now involved. Now the beauty industry was boycotting the range that my mom had worked so hard to create. The next day after school, my mom seemed to be in good spirits. She took me for a milkshake, and we sang along to Disney tunes in the car. I thought that everything was back to normal, but then we arrived home, and she sat me down and said to me, Sally, you're going to be my model, and save this family. Then she filmed herself applying her makeup products on me. She turned to the camera and said, See, I dare to use my products on my daughter's delicate skin, because I know there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. The problem is that footage of a young girl having her makeup done is Boring in comparison to the shocking pictures of a famous model with burned skin. All the brands turned their backs on her, and she went from super successful entrepreneur to blacklisted overnight. An investigation later proved that the model's skin damage was due to dangerous fake Botox injections, not my mom's products. But this was too little too late as my mom had already lost all her deals and partnerships, and the money spent on pricey lawsuits made my family bankrupt. After that, mom left the beauty industry behind her. But that afternoon changed my life. I always felt a sense of self-esteem as growing up in an environment full of famous beauties. But that day, after being put on makeup by my mother, I felt so pretty. I looked in the mirror and found myself like all the dream girls I'd seen from my childhood. My new, beautiful appearance made me more confident. Since then, I started practicing makeup, and this obsession doesn't stop until I grow up. By the age of 14, I wouldn't be seen leaving the house without a full face of makeup on. It gave me this added layer of confidence and made me feel ready to face the day. When I had my makeup on, then it didn't matter as much that my parents were now poor. I looked and felt beautiful, and I could handle the world. Now at 25, I still adore makeup. I'm a self-confessed makeup addict. Even my boyfriend, Chris, had never seen my bare face. When I stayed over at his, I went to bed with a full face of makeup on. Then I waited until he'd fallen asleep so I could sneak into the bathroom and take it off and moisturize. Then I woke up two hours before he did, just so I could apply my makeup, then get back into bed and look like I'd just woken up that glamorous. Yes, keeping up appearances was hard work, but when he looked at me like I was the most beautiful girl in the world, well, that made it so worth it. Only, on one occasion, Chris woke up early and walked in on me doing my makeup. I totally freaked out and immediately covered my face with my hands and screamed out, No, don't look at me! I'm hideous! He laughed and said, Don't be silly. A bit of makeup doesn't change the fact that I love you and think you're the most beautiful girl in existence. This was sweet and all, but I still shouted at him until he left the room so I could finish off my makeup. His words got me thinking, though. Did he really, truly love me? We'd been together for two years, yet he'd never ever seen me fresh-faced. So how could he possibly know if he loved me if I wasn't wearing it? I couldn't stop thinking about this. I needed to know if he truly loved me for me or not. So I took all my makeup off. Yep, 
even my clear lip gloss. Then I tied back my hair and put on casual clothes and a pair of sneakers. I was standing right behind him at his favorite cafe. I hesitantly went to the table where he was sitting and was confused as to how to speak. That was when he looked up at me while still scrolling through his phone and said, Yeah, you can take that seat as I'm leaving soon. He didn't recognize me. Interesting. I sat down in front of him, pretending to be a shy, cute girl, and softly starting up a conversation. I tried varying the tone of my voice to ask what I should order, and it worked. He completely thought that I was just some random girl. After we chatted for ages, I said to him, I see you don't really have to leave soon, huh? He smiled and complimented me on being cute. It made me feel a lot more confident. So by then, I had the courage to tell him that I was his girlfriend. But suddenly he grinned and said, If you don't have a boyfriend, I wonder if I have a chance to get to know you? What? He was still in a relationship with me? Unbelievable! Well, another plan just popped up in my head, so I tried to stay calm and replied coyly, I'd like that. After that, I started living two different lives. When I put my makeup on and become energetic and attractive, Chris complimented me on how beautiful and charming I was and proudly showed me off to his friends. But when I appeared with a bare face and acted all coy, he said that he loved how sweet and rustic I was and that he thought girls who wore makeup all day were tragic. Tragic? How dare he? He would lie about going out with friends so he could spend more time with makeup free me. Then he kissed makeup me and told me how he loved how glamorous I was and how I was the only girl for him. Yeah, right. I couldn't believe how fake this guy was. There I was thinking he loved me, but now he was cheating on me. With me. A playboy like him didn't deserve any version of me. So it was time for revenge. So when he asked makeup for me to go on a trip, I shyly accepted. I knew he just wanted to trick an innocent girl into bed with him. But I'm not an ordinary girl anyways. As he was chilling out in the pool, I shyly said I would take a shower and wait for him inside. And I swear I saw his eyes brightened like a magpie. I ran into the bathroom to turn the shower on. Then I left a trail of makeup free me's clothes and then snuck out into the room nearby that I'd booked for the night. There, I transformed into makeup me, then got back ringing the doorbell. Obviously, he had to hurry from the pool to open the door, and when he saw me, he turned so pale. I walked in without his welcome, calmly walked through the luxurious room, and picked up every trace of adultery I'd previously scattered on the floor. The sundress, the bikini, and even lingerie. Then I threw them at him. He was unable to say a word and got panicked when I kept walking straight to the toilet, where there was the sound of a shower pouring water, calmly saying, the person I need to hit is inside, isn't she? He panicked and ran in between me and the door. It's not worth your action, honey. She's nothing. You know you're my only one. I asked him, is she beautiful? Nah, she's boring and old-fashioned. Not like you. I pushed him away and opened the door to enter. He panicked, jumped right behind me and froze when his mistress was nowhere to be found in the hot shower steam. He probably thought she somehow escaped herself and, at least, saved his life. I still walked in, undressed, and put a bathrobe on myself right in front of him, then walked over to the mirror and started removing my makeup. He was still so bold and shameless. I completely had you fooled. There is no girl. This is my plan to bring you here. Let's enjoy the night, babe. He really had a talent for lying. I just silently removed all the makeup on my face. I've never seen you remove your makeup. Tonight will be really great, he said as he walked over to hug me from behind. I finished by tying my hair up and wiping the steam on the mirror with my hand and said, So, who do you want to sleep with tonight? He looked up into the mirror to see another me and screamed in horror, running away as if he'd seen a ghost. That night... I gloatingly stayed in that luxury hotel room and enjoyed the first day of my single life. Makeup is my passion and hobby, and I won't change it for anyone, especially for that kind of guy. But I now realize that I deserve to find a guy who loves me unconditionally, whether I'm the glamorous, makeup-covered version of me or just plain, coy, makeup-free me. Hi everyone, I'm Amanda, and I'm 17 years old. 
This is a story about how I fell in love with my adoptive dad and the crazy things I discovered because of it. I need to be honest, as I've not had the easiest life, so when I fell in love with him, I probably wasn't thinking straight. My childhood was tough, as it was just me and my mom, and we lived in a slum in the city. My mom was pretty irritable, and she always took it out on me when she'd had too much to drink. I got used to it quickly, and hardly even cried when she did this. I just thought it was normal to be treated like this. But when I was seven, my mom got arrested for fraud and drug use, and she got sentenced to ten years in prison! I'll never forget the moment the police broke our door down and took my mom away. It was late at night, and I just screamed and cried. All I had was my mom. Without her, I was nobody. Even though she hurt me when she was drunk, she was still my mom, and I loved her so much, and she loved me too. After she was taken away, and the police said I wouldn't see her for a while, social services placed me in an orphanage. Life there was even worse than in the slum with my mom, but I told myself it was only 10 years, and that as soon as my mom was released from prison, she'd come get me, and that by then, she'd have changed and wouldn't hit me anymore. But that's not what happened. After one year, an old couple came to adopt me. They'd been trying to have a baby for years with no luck. I thought maybe this was my chance to finally have a loving home. They cried with happiness when they saw me, but the minute we got back to their house, everything went downhill. They were both quite old and strict, and immediately sat me down and went over their set of rules. It was torture. Anytime I did one thing wrong, like accidentally breaking a glass or spilling some soy sauce on the table, they'd punish me by starving me for the whole day, until I almost fainted. After three months of this, they took me back to the orphanage and complained that I was a spoiled little brat with no manners. To be honest though, I was relieved. They were old and grumpy, and we clearly weren't well suited. Years passed by, and when I was 12, I was adopted by another family who ran a small restaurant. I stupidly thought it would be better this time, and at first it was, but pretty soon they started making me help out in the restaurant, doing all their chores and even the housework at home. I very quickly realized they'd basically just adopted me so I could be their maid. But there was one nice thing about this family, their son. His name was Jose and he was two years older than me. Unlike his parents, he was actually super kind. He would often steal food from me from the kitchen and even helped me finish the chores. But one time, his mom saw Jose helping me and thought I'd forced him into it. She was so angry at me, she took me straight back to the orphanage. I couldn't believe it. After four years, they just sent me back. After those two disastrous attempts at being adopted, I thought I'd never find a family who actually wanted me. I pretty much gave up all hope and resigned myself to the fact that I just have to endure the orphanage life until my mom got let out of prison. But then, one day, a man named James came to the orphanage to volunteer, and that's when my life changed. He looked quite young, around 40 or so, and he had a kind smile. Often, I'd catch him looking at me, and it made me feel quite shy. No one had ever paid me attention like this before, not even my mom. Then one day, the woman who worked at the orphanage took me aside and told me that James wanted to adopt me. I told them I wasn't interested, and then I went to my room. Honestly, I was sick and tired of these foster families who just used me. I didn't want to go through that again. The next day, I was sitting on the swing in the garden of the orphanage when James came over. I got up off the swing and was about to leave when he asked if we could sit and talk a little bit. I was really hesitant but he had such a kind face, and I felt bad being rude. He then showed me a photo of a woman and a child, and I couldn't believe how much the child looked like me when I was younger. He told me that they were his wife and his daughter, but that they had died in a car accident eight months ago, and that he still couldn't get over the loss. So he'd been coming to the orphanage to volunteer, and now he felt ready to adopt someone. Then he looked at me and said, As soon as I saw you, Amanda, I knew you were the one I wanted to adopt. I didn't know what to say. I felt so sorry for him, and I knew what it felt like to experience loss. So I told him I'd be happy if he wanted to adopt me. He was so excited, and the very next day, he came to pick me up and take me to my new home. 
I was quite nervous, but as soon as I saw how cozy the house was, covered in family photos, and with a nice bedroom for me, I knew I'd made the right decision. James was the perfect adoptive dad. He was polite and kind and always listened to me. He didn't make me do chores, and he didn't create a strict set of rules for me to follow. With him, I could just be myself, and for the first time in years, I was happy. He made me laugh so much. Finally, life was good. But there was just one little problem. You see, I was a teenage girl, and the more time I spent with James, the more I started to think I liked him in a way that wasn't appropriate for a relationship between an adoptive dad and his daughter. One night, he was getting out of the shower, and he'd left the door open. I saw him standing there, wearing a towel around his waist, and I couldn't take my eyes off him. I knew it was wrong to be looking, but I just couldn't stop. Then one day, he was doing some gardening, and he hurt his back. I offered to give him a massage, and he was so grateful. As I rubbed his back with oil, he said to me, Oh, Amanda, your hands are so soft. I haven't felt so comfortable in a long time. I was glad he couldn't see my face, because I was blushing like crazy. Afterwards, he offered to give me a foot massage, but I said no because I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. I liked him so much, and that night, I went to bed wondering if he liked me too. And then one night, he asked if he could read me a bedtime story. Even though I was 16, he said he'd always read to his daughter and he missed it. So I said sure he could, and then, you won't believe it, he fell asleep next to me, in my bed! I barely slept a wink that night. I just watched him as he slept and had to stop myself from reaching out to stroke his hair. I so badly wanted to tell him how I felt. But for now, this was enough. Just being close to him and getting to have a peaceful life together. Little did I know that our peace was about to be disrupted. A woman moved in next door to us. Her name was Rosa, and she was seriously gorgeous. After she'd unpacked, we went over to say hi, and straight away, I regretted it. She immediately started flirting with James, even reaching out and stroking his arm as she said, Oh my, look at those muscles. I'll need your help setting up my kitchen, if you don't mind. James just laughed and said he'd be happy to help. As we walked away, I looked back and saw Rosa checking out James, and I knew she was going to be trouble. And sure enough, after that first meeting, she kept popping up. The next day, she asked James to help her fix a light bulb, and then a few days later, she came over with a plate of muffins to thank him. She never really spoke to me. She only had eyes for James, and I didn't like it one bit. Was she trying to steal him from me? The more she hung around, the more jealous I became. Everything had been perfect until she turned up, and now I was so scared James would fall for her and I'd be all alone again. My feelings were becoming so intense, so I decided there was only one thing for it. I had to tell him how I felt. I was pretty sure he had feelings for me too. I had to act quick, before Rosa made a move. So everyone loves Christmas, right? Trust me, it's not so great when your boss fires you in November. How was I supposed to buy presents now? Still, I tried to see the positives. I hated that boring, underpaid, overworked job anyway. My ex-boss Adrian was the worst. He's a crazy perfectionist who always gave me ridiculous deadlines, complained about every tiniest mistake, and flipped out if things didn't go his way. No wonder he was still single at 32. Who could ever stand him? I wouldn't miss him, or my tragic ass-kissing co-workers. Anyways, on the bright side, I'd get to spend the entire holiday season with my family and my boyfriend Matt in peace, without being bothered by any annoying work emails. I, in fact, have invited Matt over for Thanksgiving dinner with my parents, and plan to spend this cozy weekend with my loved ones. Then, the day before Thanksgiving, I packed up my car and was about to go and pick Matt up when my phone beeped. Sonia. I don't think Thanksgiving is a good idea. I just think we need some time apart. Hope you have a great time. See you around. X. What? Had he just broken up with me over text message? I immediately rang him up, but he turned his phone off. Just great. Here I was, stuck at home for the entire Thanksgiving and Christmas period, being a jobless 
boyfriendless loser. To make it worse, even my little sister Gina had a boyfriend who adored her. This is so unfair. One night, my parents were out to buy a Christmas tree, and Gina had her boyfriend over to help put up Christmas lights and decorations. Well, needless to say, love was in the air, and that festive vibe didn't help at all with my misery. So I refused to join them and curled up in my room. Feeling so lonely and miserable, I downloaded Tinder. I usually wasn't one for dating apps, but I was feeling so low, I would have happily spoken to anyone. I didn't feel like being me. I was sick of being me, so I used the fake name Crystal and just put some artsy scenery pictures up. I could be whoever I wanted to be. And you know what? It seemed to be working, as a few guys wanted to talk to me. Okay, most of them were also bored, or only after one thing, but then there's this guy called Carl that caught my attention. Like me, he had no pictures of himself, but instead, he had images of song lyrics and movie quotes, including the quote, The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I love the movie Lost in Translation, so I sent him a message telling him he had good taste in films, and he messaged me back complimenting the scenery photos I took. After that, we started chatting days and nights. We talked about everything, from the dumb to the meaningful. He actually helped me out a lot and made the Christmas period bearable for me. It was all going great, until Christmas Eve. He sent me a message to wish me a Merry Christmas, along with, let's meet up for a drink. Oh no. Even though the app said he was only a few miles away, I wasn't ready for meetups. I actually was nervous upon reading his text. My heart was pounding, and I found myself worrying about what he would think of me when we met. What if he didn't look like what I imagined? What if he'd be disappointed when he saw me? Why does that even matter though? Unless, I developed feelings for him. I don't even know anymore. But it's certain that I couldn't face him just yet. I politely refused his invitation. He was cool about it. Then we still continued to talk like normal. I survived Christmas. And then for New Year's Eve, Gina persuaded me to go to a party with her boyfriend and friends. I wasn't really keen to join, but I guessed I needed to do something to stop this gloominess. As I was walking in, I was so busy brushing off the snow on my shoulder that I bumped into a guy. To my horror, I looked up and saw that it was my old boss, Adrian. Why was he here, in my hometown? He was also shocked, but managed to smile at me. But I just gave him a glare, rolled my eyes, flipped back my hair, then strode off. What a mood killer! I grabbed a drink and sat in the corner in an attempt to avoid bumping into Adrian again. Gina found me and tried dragging me onto the dance floor, but I refused. Then she winked at me and in a tipsy voice said, You need a man to dance with. I'll be right back. Five minutes later, she excitedly waved at me and shouted over, Found one! I just want to facepalm as I saw her dragging Adrian by the hand over to me. Talk about awkward. But still, I mumbled out a hi, downed a shot for courage, and then chatted to him. Okay, it turns out he was visiting his grandparents who lived around here, and he was actually an okay guy to talk to. After I spent most of the night talking to him, he bought a drink, then said to me, I have to admit that after the death stare you gave me on entry, I was afraid for my life. But it turns out, I've enjoyed chatting with you. Sorry, I blushed. No, it's okay. I'd be mad with me too if I were you. Letting you go from work was nothing personal. I had to let one person go, and... I only chose you because I knew you were wasted there. Um, thanks, I guess, I laughed. Let's get another shot. Okay, so maybe Adrian wasn't that bad of a person after all. And I don't know if it's because of all the drinks we downed, the atmosphere, or the fact that everyone else around us was sharing New Year's kisses, that I almost felt like Adrian looked like he wanted to kiss me on the strike of midnight too. And I too didn't dodge it. Luckily, nothing happened. I mean, that would have been weird, right? The next day, Adrian messaged me, saying he would help me set up a job interview at a big media company. Wow, that's amazing! Now I had no excuse to sulk around anymore. I needed to get back to the city and sort my life out. Only, I still couldn't get Carl out of my head. I guessed these feelings were real. To clear up my mind, I decided to confess to him online. But then he messaged me back, saying... I think you're great, and I love talking to you, but I have a crush on my coworker. I'm sorry, but I'd like to stay friends. Ouch! Rejection hurt! Back in the city, I felt lonelier than ever. Yes, I'd got the new job, and it was going well, but I was sick of seeing loved-up couples everywhere. 
To make it worse, Gina came to stay with me for a while, and she's always on the phone, giggling and FaceTiming her boyfriend. Now I couldn't even escape lovebirds in my own apartment. Feeling down, I messaged Carl again, just casually asked him to meet up later this weekend when I would be back home again for my mom's birthday. Well, to be honest, I just couldn't give him up just yet. Maybe he would change his mind when we met? Or I would be able to get over him once we meet. But he made up some excuse to reject me again. That was it, I told myself. It's official over now. Depressed, I called Adrian up for a drink. He arrived looking kinda cute, but the sting of rejection was still on my mind. I confided to Adrian, and I asked him if he thought Carl was a fool for turning me down? Adrian slammed his drink onto the table and turned to me and said, You're the fool. Why are you stupidly chasing after some guy online? He might not even be real. He might be some 60-year-old pervert. Why won't you just open your eyes and look in front of you? Then he stood up, locked me in his arms, and tried to kiss me. What? I was so mad I pulled myself away from him and slapped him straight across the face before I stomped off. He was meant to be my friend, not some guy after just one thing. I was so hurt, I cried while texting Carl about what just happened, but he didn't reply. The next day, I woke up with a pounding head and puffy eyes. I checked my phone. Adrian had called me, but nothing from Carl. He must have been too busy with his coworker, huh? Suddenly, I heard the door knock. My sister answered it and told me it was Adrian. I reluctantly went out to see him. I mean, I guess I needed to at least hear him out. He was standing there looking sheepish as he said, I'm so sorry about last night, Sonia. I was slightly drunk and I guess I've read the signals wrong. For what it's worth, I think that Carl guy is a fool for letting you go. You're amazing. I wasn't in the mood to talk to him, so said it was fine, then told him to leave. I closed the door and threw myself on the sofa. Then about ten minutes later, there was someone at the door again. I answered it, and there was Adrian, but this time, he changed his outfit. Confused, I grumbled, what else do you want? Then, he politely greeted me. Hello, Crystal. Let me introduce myself. I'm Carl. We've been talking for months. I guess, if you think about it, the more you know who you are, and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I stared at him open-mouthed. He just quoted Lost in Translation, and he'd called me Crystal. Then reality struck me. OMG! All this time, and Adrian was Carl? I dragged him inside. We sat down on the sofa and talked everything out. It's so unreal! Turns out the guy I've been chasing after is literally right in front of me. How ironic! I was so happy I hugged him and broke down crying, apologizing. Right then, my sister walked out from the kitchen, took one look at us, and laughed out, Well, 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 isn't this the awful boss who fired you? But most importantly, isn't he the guy I brought to you at the New Year's Eve party? You two owe me big time. We all burst out laughing. So, yeah, after a horrid holiday season... Now I finally could start a promising new year with a great job and a pretty awesome new boyfriend. I guess things always have a way of working out in the end, right? Thank you for listening to my story, and wish you guys a good start into the new year. From the outside, it seemed like I'm a lucky girl who was achieving her goals one by one, from an outstanding rich kid boyfriend to a dream job. But somehow, my life was going downhill uncontrollably. I was standing in front of a hotel room, banging the door, and hoped that my boyfriend wasn't inside. I didn't understand. Just a few minutes ago, we were together at our two-year anniversary. He was so caring and sweet, and he even invited me to his mom's birthday party. Everything was great, until his phone rang. He told me it was a work thing, and he had to leave. His work thing should never have happened here. But to my horror, Ed answered the door. He was completely flummoxed when he saw me, and the moment I looked over his shoulder, I saw a woman. She was sitting on the bed and eating chocolates with her cool, calm mind. Not like me. Yep, you guessed it. It was Diane. Hey, Bella. So nice of you to join us, she smirked at me. I just stared at them, open-mouthed. This was the worst day of my life and I didn't know how I was meant to react. Worse still, Ed didn't seem bothered that I was upset. No, all he cared about was the fact that people were walking past and giving him odd looks. 
He pulled me inside of that disgusting room and closed the door. This was the last place I wanted to be, but I knew I deserved answers. Why are you here, Bella? He asked me. You? And her? I muttered out. Diane walked over to him and started rubbing his shoulders. Then she grinned at me and said, It sure looks like it, doesn't it? Bella, I'm sorry, he said. Yeah, me too, I replied before I hurried out of there. Those traitors were welcome to each other. I was done. I was shaking so hard that I had to lean my back against the wall in the hotel lobby and burst out crying. Jeez, my heart ached so much. I wanted to hate Ed, but I still loved him. Worse still, I was still wearing the prettiest dress ever. At the start of the night, I'd felt like a princess, and now I felt like anything but a loser. I arrived home in tears, feeling so heartbroken and ashamed. What was wrong with me? How could he hurt me like this? Then my phone beeped. It was a message from Ed. I'm truly sorry, Bella. I will make it up to you. What? How exactly did he intend on making it up to me? Was he going to give me a pay raise or get me promoted? Jeez, how could he not see that this couldn't be fixed in that way? He'd ruined what we had. And what for? A bit of fun with some mean girl? I didn't even know who Ed was anymore. He changed so much, and now it felt like he was someone else entirely. The next day, I told Jim I was too sick to come into work. There was no way I could deal with seeing them all lovey-dovey together. But I would get over this. I'm a strong-minded person with big ambitions for my career, and there's no way I was letting them win. I just needed time for my body and mind to heal before I could go back to work and face them every day. But it was just so hard. I loved him and trusted him more than myself. Now the fact that he was cheating just broke my heart and drained my energy. I couldn't stop crying for days and eventually felt like this was just not right. I would just become a loser only if I accepted it. I obviously deserved better than some cheating idiot in my life. Yeah, right. I had to move on, keep chasing my dream, and try my hardest for my own life, instead of wasting my time for someone who didn't deserve it. I wasn't hiding anymore, so I went back to work. When I arrived there, Jim came over to me and told me all about this amazing project he wanted me to work on if, of course, I was feeling up to it. Thanks, Jim as this was the exact thing I needed right now to give me the kick I needed to move on. I immediately told him yes. I was ready to put my all into it. However, on my first day back to work, everyone in the office was gossiping about me. I knew this was down to Diane bragging about how Ed broke up with me for her. To make it even worse, Diane kept on popping up in front of me and loudly telling anyone who would listen how an amazing boyfriend Ed was. Ugh. Why couldn't she just leave me alone? She was Ed's girlfriend now. Why wasn't that enough for her? I just didn't understand why she was so mean. Worse still, I then had to endure some boring meeting with both Diane and Ed. I was sitting next to Jim and trying my best not to look over at them when Ed announced who the new sales manager was. I swear my heart plummeted when he said it was Diane. When we finished the work, she stormed over to me swished her hair, then said, This is such a great week for me. I now have an awesome job to go with my amazing new boyfriend. I ignored her, pretending like I didn't hear her, and tried my best not to look like she was getting to me. No way was I going to cry in front of the entire office. She looked straight at me as she said, Of course, I expect all work to be the highest standard, else there will be consequences. Jim piped in, Diane, you're in charge of sales? not the entire company. Now, if you excuse us, we have work to do. Thank goodness for Jim, as there's no way I could have endured that meeting any longer. Right when we were out of the meeting room, I asked Jim about my upcoming project. All I wanted now was putting my focus into my work. Only, Jim apologized that he was busy doing some emergency things, then asked if we could discuss the new project over dinner. I immediately agreed. Not only was I super excited to find out more about it, 
but it meant I wouldn't be stuck at home with nothing but my thoughts. He took me to this cool diner, which I'd never been to before, as Ed was a bit of a snob when it came to eating out and had refused to go anywhere but posh restaurants. Jim told me how it was a creative design project for a park entrance gate, and he was allowing me to make all the important decisions. Whoa, this was my golden chance to show what I was capable of. Since then, Jim became my knight in shining armor. He let me eat lunch in his office, and it was so good being away from all my gaping colleagues. We talked about this big project, joked about, and shared our sandwiches. On one such occasion, I was eating one of his peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when he looked at me, hesitated, then said, Do you remember what we talked about? That time at that bar? I nervously laughed, as I wasn't expecting him to bring that up again. Yeah, we talked a lot. I was a bit drunk that night, he replied. Yes, but I wasn't. I told you that I trusted Ed and believed he would never let you down and that I would help you get payback if it ever turned out I was wrong about him. I sighed. <sighs> I remember. It was a ridiculous wager. Bella, I'm a man of word. I'm here if you need me to help you get your own back on him. I can't say I hadn't daydreamed about getting revenge on him. In my mind, there were many occasions where I had, whether it be by chopping up his clothes or by sending an email to the entire office listing his worst habits. I could have made my daydream a reality, but I wasn't going to. Ed was just a bad guy, and even though what he did hurt like crazy, I was going to learn and grow from it. So I replied, thanks Jim, but it's okay. I'm not going to do that because that isn't the type of person I want to be. And it wouldn't be fair to make you that type of person either. Thanks, though. It means a lot that you'd do that for me. I saw how relieved Jim looked. He was a man of his word. But there's no doubting that he was a great guy. And getting revenge on people, even if they deserved it, wasn't his thing. So I continued to put my all into this project and try not to let work dramas get me down. Then one day, I turned up at work and saw Mr. Stafford in the foyer talking to Diane. This was strange, as on the rare occasions he was here, he tended to shut himself away in his office. Not only that, he looked so angry. I watched as a terrified-looking Diane followed him to his office. Then a few minutes later, Ed rushed up there too. Talk about drama! Oh well, at least no one was talking about me for once. By lunchtime, news got around that Diane had been fired. It turned out that she'd sold our company's design to another rival company, and now they were using it on one of the other construction projects. Jim was very annoyed about this, and I saw him getting angry with Ed on the fire escape. I got his point. It felt like our creativity had been stolen to benefit a girl who they never should have hired in the first place. Of course, Ed insisted he hadn't known anything about it, and he'd ended it with Diane as soon as he found out. He'd also convinced his dad not to pursue legal action against her. I knew that this was probably just to save his own ass. I mean, she was his girlfriend, after all. She could have implicated him in it. Now, thanks to Diane, we'd have to change some of the design elements on that project. This was a massive undertaking, and my teammates and I had to work overtime and it was intense. One morning, I walked into work feeling tired and lethargic at the prospect of another long day when I saw a bunch of roses on my desk. I opened the card to see they were from Ed, with a note saying, Bella, I miss you so much. Please give me another chance. Ed. X. Wow. He'd just broken up with Diane, and now he wanted me back? Hey, I'm Ryan, and I'm here to prove why it's impossible for guys and girls to just be friends. Yeah, I know it's the 21st century and all, but I only reached this conclusion through experience. My ex, Carrie, was friends with this super annoying guy called Chris. They'd known each other for years, but it was obvious he liked her. I saw how gooey-eyed he was around her. She was so insistent that there was nothing going on between them, but guess what? After we broke up, it didn't take long for them to go official on social media. After that, I started dating this awesome girl called Lily. I didn't even mind the fact that there were a few guys in her group, as I eventually befriended them all too. 
They're all nice, and especially this one guy, Todd, seems like a cool dude. We played basketball together and chatted about video games. Lily didn't like me talking to him, though. She said she found it weird that I was so friendly with him. And she'd rather I wasn't. Whatever, I just put this down to the fact that girls could be weird sometimes. Okay, so maybe Lily didn't seem to like Todd all that much. She never sat by him or really spoke to him. It was probably just some ridiculous girl drama thing. So I continued to chat with Todd as normal. He was a genuine guy who did nice things. Such as when Lily got super drunk at some party, he was the one who called me up to come and get her. And then he stayed up with her until I arrived. I actually kind of felt sorry for Todd. As the rest of the group all had partners, so he was left being the gooseberry. Once, when me and Lily were feeding each other strawberries and being all lovey-dovey, I noticed how glum he looked. Suddenly, an idea popped into my head. I should help him find a girlfriend. So I have this one friend called Gemma. She's sweet and pretty, but she can be a little on the overbearing side. She's always sneaking candy bars in my backpack with sticky notes on them saying, Enjoy, love, G, X. And she likes every single picture I post on social media pages. I've told her I'm not interested in her like that as I'm with Lily, but she always just smiles and says, I know that, silly. Anyway, Todd struck me as the kind of guy who may like a candy-giving, slightly clingy girl. So on a group outing to the cinema, I told him how I felt bad for him being the only single one in the group, and how I had this friend who'd be perfect for him. At first, he shook his head and said, thanks, but no thanks, as he wasn't looking for a girlfriend right now. I wasn't taking no for an answer. So the next week, I bombarded him with messages all about how amazing Gemma was. In the end, he agreed to go on a date with her. And afterwards, he messaged me, thanking me for setting it up and telling me how he'd had a great time. Result? Just call me Dr. Love, please. Oh, you're welcome. My relationship with Lily was going great. So when she said she was going away for the night with her friends, I told her this was cool as I trusted her and I trusted them. Then at 3 a.m. when I was shooting zombies on my game, my phone buzzed. It was Todd. We've been playing Truth or Dare. Sorry, but I think you need to hear this. This was followed by a voice message. My heart sank, as in a tipsy voice I heard Lily say, Before loving Ryan, I actually had feelings for another guy, and I kind of still do now be... The recording ended there. Not that it mattered, as I'd heard enough. My girlfriend liked someone else. Then Todd messaged me. Sorry for that, bro. Thought you deserved the heads up. I thanked him for his honesty. I knew it must have been hard for him to call out Lily. As I saw it, he was a really good guy with the right intentions. For obvious reasons that night, I couldn't sleep at all. So the next morning, I got up early and went for a jog to try and clear my mind fog. That's when Gemma rang me up and asked me out on a picnic. I agreed. I figured that it'd be moping around, all miserable. By the time I arrived back from my jog, Gemma was already parked outside of my dorm, a smile on her face and a picnic basket in hand. I commented on how quick she'd packed it and she blushed and mentioned something about female intuition. I stank, so I went and showered quickly. Then, as I was getting into Gemma's car, Lily messaged me, telling me she'd be back by noon and I should come over for lunch. But I'm not in any mood to deal with her just yet. So I messaged her, saying I was busy with an assignment. The picnic was great. It was such a sunny day, and Gemma filled the basket with all of my favorite treats. I arrived back feeling positive about things. So what if Lily had a crush on another guy? It didn't mean she didn't love me, right? So I went over to Lily's place, but when she opened the door, she just scowled at me and said, Oh, it's you. Of course it was me. Who else would it be? I followed her inside, but her mood only worsened. I tried asking her about her trip, but she answered with shrugs and eye rolls. Feeling annoyed, I asked her what her problem was. Then she just went into full rage mode and shouted at me. What's my problem? Why don't we talk about you? Where have you been today? Don't think you can lie to me. Then she showed me on her phone, and on the screen was one of Gemma's posts about how she'd had a lovely picnic with me. We're just friends, Lily, you know that. You spent all night with your guy friends, and I didn't moan about it. Well, I know she likes you, and now you're just hanging out with her behind my back. Fueled by anger, I yelled at her. So what? You're not really innocent either. I know you prefer some other guy over me. Well, then I suggest you go and date him instead. What? Whatever. You know what? Fine. Maybe I will. Yeah, well, I think you should. I stormed out of there and charged up the street. 
By the time I arrived back at my dorm, the reality dawned on me that I'd just broken up with the love of my life. Jeez, this sucked. From then on, whenever I saw Lily around campus, she totally ignored me. It was the worst feeling ever. Todd messaged me a lot to check if I was okay. I kind of hoped he could help me get back with Lily, but I was getting some seriously weird vibes from him. Once, he even sent a message saying, You're an amazing guy, and you're way too good for Lily anyway. Okay, weird. Did he have a crush on me? That would explain why Lily was wary of me making friends with him. Worse still, I had Gemma hanging around me like some sort of limpet. Because I was lonely, I agreed to go for a coffee with her. She left her phone on the table when she went to the toilet. It beeped, so I looked at it. And that's when I saw that Todd had a picture of her, of him holding Lily in her arms, with the caption, Hey, look, I've succeeded. You two quickly finish your quest, although maybe we should pass on the double date. As Gemma walked back over, I waved the picture in front of her and said, I think you have some explaining to do. The color drained from her face, but she gave me a feeble nod. It turns out that on her date with Todd, they discussed how she was crazy about me and how he was into Lily. Then Todd had shown Gemma the messages I'd sent him, telling him how great she was and why I thought he should date her. So he made out I must secretly like her and suggested they come up with a plan to split us up. There I was, thinking Todd was my friend, but turns out the whole time he was an evil genius. Crying, Gemma played me the full voice message that Todd had sent her from that night. Before loving Ryan, I actually had feelings for another guy. And I still kind of do now, but it doesn't matter, as I've decided that Ryan's the guy for me. Besides, some of you have probably noticed that the other guy, well, it's Todd. We're just friends though, so let's leave it be. I told Gemma to stay away from me. Then I stormed out of there. She shouted after me, but I ignored her, and I've been ignoring her ever since. So, there we go. In the end, opposite-sex friendships never bring any good. I wanted to believe that guys and girls could just be friends, but clearly, they can't. I've given this a lot of thought, and decided to tell Lily everything, as she deserves to know what a cruel and conniving guy Todd is. I don't know how she'll react, but I know I have to let her know, right? I hope she gives me another chance, but it might be too late. Todd tore us apart with his mind games, and I stood by and let him. Jeez, I miss her. Wish me luck. Hey, Cat here. Again. I hope you're not bored of me yet. <laughs> As if. Anyway, here's a recap of the last part of my story so far. In the last episode, I confessed my feelings to my crush, Garrett, but he rejected me because I was not girly enough for him. To make it even worse, he said he liked Taylor and wanted me to help them become a couple. I couldn't believe it. I was so furious that I argued with my mom. Then I came to my dad's house, and that's when my dad asked me to help him get back with mom. Apparently, I jumped at the chance and immediately put my healing family relationships plan into action. But suddenly, Max said that he wanted to tell me something important. So, okay. He led me out to the garden. I followed him and kept wondering what he wanted to talk to me about. Did he know I wanted to split him and my mom up and he was going to scold me for it? No way! As soon as we sat down, I asked him immediately, What's the matter? He just smiled. I wanted to chat with you so that we could understand each other better. I gave him a doubtful look. Why did he suddenly care about me? Jeez. This was so awkward. Then Max said, Kat, I know that you want your parents to get back together. He hesitated a bit, then continued, I don't dare to say that I'm better than your dad, but, you know, we are all from broken families, and I just want to give you, your mom, and Taylor a happy home life. So, I hope that you'll accept me and give me a chance. I didn't know how to reply to him. Okay, so... I knew that Max truly loved my mom, as he always looked at her affectionately. But what about my dad? He was miserable without mom, and if given the chance, he would definitely make us happy. As for Max, I was sure he'd have no trouble finding someone else. Okay, so I might have said Max was kind, but the reality was, he wasn't right for mom, but my dad was. I mean, they had history, and they had me. The wedding day loomed closer, and Mum and Max grew even soppier together. I wanted to cancel the wedding, but it seemed impossible. But then I realized something. 
maybe I could somehow delay it? I had thought seriously for a few days. Then I came up with an idea. I would pretend to break my leg. If I couldn't come to the wedding, my mom had to postpone it, right? OMG! I was absolutely a genius. I immediately messaged Harry and told him about my bright idea for my get dad back with mom plan. Naturally, he replied I was bonkers, but he agreed to help me. He even told me how that could work, as his cousin was a doctor and he would definitely help us. Awesome! However, to make this plan work, first of all, I had to appear helpful so mom wouldn't suss me out. So I kept asking her about the wedding preparations and said that she could tell me if she needed help. At first, she was quite surprised, but then she looked so happy and satisfied Maybe mom thought that her beloved daughter had finally grown up. That day, after school, I put the plan into action. Of course, with the help of Harry's doctor cousin. His cousin was really helpful. After bandaging my leg, he even gave me advice on how to walk, like I had really broken it. Then Harry took me home. When seeing me, my mom was totally terrified. She kept asking us what had happened. Harry lied that during a game of soccer, I tried to steal the ball and fallen awkwardly on my leg. I hadn't wanted to worry them, so he'd taken me to his cousin's clinic. I'd fractured it, and it would take me about four weeks to recover. His story was so real that I almost believed it myself. He was absolutely the best comrade in my life. After that, Mom spent more time taking care of me and wasn't as strict as before. Honestly, it was great. However, I really missed practice, and lying on my bed all day wasn't as fun as it sounded. My bedroom was on the second floor, so my mom always brought me food so that I didn't need to go downstairs. One day, after lunch, I was so bored that I decided to go over to my desk to pick up my laptop and play some music. While I was standing and swinging to the rhythm, my mom came in with a plate of fruit in her hand. I was so surprised but I immediately leaned on the desk and said, Ay. She rushed to help me and asked what I was doing. In my most pitiful voice, I said, Mom, I wanted to practice walking for your big day, but my leg just hurts so much, and I'm not sure I'll be able to cope with the wedding. She stroked my hair and said, It's okay, honey. Harry will come with you to the wedding and help you out. I leaned on her and sobbed. I can't do it. You see, Taylor will look like a princess, and I'll look like an Egyptian mummy. I wish there was some way the wedding could be delayed for a bit. My voice was smaller, and my eyes filled with false tears. Oh my god, forget soccer. I needed to join the drama club. The next day, she came into my room with Max, and she told me that they had some big news. We can't contemplate getting married without you there, so we've decided to postpone the wedding until your leg is better. O-M-G. I'm a genius! But I tried not to look too excited. As soon as they left my room, I messaged Dad and told him the amazing news. Then I told him that I'd given him more time, but he needed to up his game. After that, Dad dropped in all the time, with the excuse that he wanted to check on me. But the problem was that Max was always around, so Dad couldn't have any private time with Mom. Cue the next step of my plan. I told my mom that I wanted to move down to Taylor's bedroom as her room was on the first floor, so I could walk around the house and get some fresh air. She agreed Taylor and I could switch rooms. But I begged again, No way! Taylor stole my crush, and now she's gonna live in my room? It's too much to even think about. Why don't you tell Max and Taylor to move out for a while? At least, until my leg's better. Whenever I see Taylor running and dancing around, it bugs me out. She's so insensitive. Mom looked flustered, but she tried to keep calm and persuaded me to exchange the room with Taylor, just until my leg was better. At that point, Max came in. Turns out, he'd overheard our conversation. He turned to her and said, Mary, I think Taylor and I should go and stay with my parents for a while. Then, when Kat's all healed up, we can come back. Mom's eyes filled up with tears, and I did feel a little bad, but when I saw him kiss her on the top of the head, I just felt annoyed. Mom belonged with Dad, not him. 
That night, while I was lying on the bed and texting Harry, Taylor stormed in, looking furious. I took my eyes off the phone, smirked, and said, Oh, it's nice of you to take time out of packing to visit me. She yelled at me, Stop being so selfish and stop this! Because of you, the wedding has been delayed, and now you're kicking us out? Newsflash, this is my home too, Cat. The world doesn't just revolve around you. I stared at her. O-M-G. Why couldn't she just shut up and leave already? I told her, you can stay here, but first, you need to break up with Garrett. She was furious and ran out without saying anything. Finally, Max and Taylor moved out. Plus, Harry told me that Taylor had broken up with Garrett. Oh my god, that feeble girl was so docile. Life was pretty awesome, but I couldn't wait to lose that itchy bandage. Dad popped by loads to take care of me. He even brought some cherry cakes and tulips, my mom's favorites for her. I felt like after all these storms, my family were finally reunited. Then, after a whole agonizing month, it was time for the bandage to go. Of course, I couldn't go to the clinic with my mom, so I came up with some excuse that I wanted to eat her clam soup when I got back. It worked, as she called Harry to go with me. When the bandage was removed, I cheered, and Harry laughed at me. I hope it was worth it, Cat. he said. It totally was. I winked at him. I arrived home expecting Mom to greet me excitedly, but she wasn't in the kitchen. I heard voices coming from upstairs, so I stealthily put my ear against the door and heard Mom's voice. We're over, Satya. How can you beg for me back after what you did? Then I heard Dad reply, I'm so sorry. It was all my fault. I should never have forced you to have an abortion just because the baby was a girl. But you know the pressures of having a son in India. Moreover, then there were your complications. You had one chance at having a baby. That's why I thought holding out for a son would be better. But that was the past. I've changed now. I love you and our daughter. And I just want to take care of you both. Oh, please. You only support Cat dressing like a boy because you want her to be a boy. Please, stop bothering us and leave us alone. What? Turns out, Dad had never truly supported me. He just wanted to have a son? He was the one who didn't want me to exist in the world. All along, he was the villain, not Mom. I felt disgusted. I slumped in front of the door and couldn't believe what I was hearing. It felt like my whole life had been one big stinking lie.